These are the cool sounds of WU2D on pulse duration modulation. One, two, three, four, five. Wow! A ton of material to cover in this video. Uh, this is where we put all of the separate parts we've been developing into the cigar box to make our primitive PDM rig. And uh, we're going to be doing uh, a filter. Of course, the, uh, the pulses that are coming out of our modulator, which is nothing more than an FET, a MOSFET that's chopping, has to be integrated so that it becomes a smooth modulation for the upper transistor, which is our Class E final. So this is all about putting it in the box, doing the initial checkout, making some circuit adjustments, and uh, it didn't all go that easy, but I can tell you PDM works. It's amazing. It actually works, and uh, I guess uh, those guys weren't lying about it. It produces pretty darn good looking AM to me, with lots of upward modulation, and uh, the diode clamp system seems to work. It all seems to hold together. So I'm going to call this video Integration. What about the schematic? What about the schematic, Mike? Hey, uh, let's do the last first. I'll give you guys a peek at the schematic. Remember, we started with this simple circuit, and here's what I've managed to do, and put it all in this box. And uh, we, I've given you some interesting features. I've given you some conveniences. Remember, he doesn't show his power supply or his microphone amplification. Looks a little more complicated. Let's start with the box build and the integration. Let's get going. So I see no need to go overboard uh, with the packaging on our PDM transmitter. Uh, this is an old box that uh, somebody bent up out of sheet metal. It's pretty heavy, pretty thick stuff. Looks like it's uh, eighth inch aluminum. Um, I want an onboard power supply and I found an old transformer that's 50 volt center tap and it certainly looks like it's at least a 4 amp transformer. So um, that's way overkill. That would give possibly 8 amps of, uh, of current if needed. We're, we're going to be needing less than 2 amps. Also I found an old LM317 steel. Uh, this is a TO3. That's capable of an amp and a half at least. Most of those can do a couple amps. And that's uh, going to give us some uh, short circuit protection. And I have an old, uh, I think this is a microwave oven uh, heat sink. And I'll drill this out for the TO3. Mount that up here where the heat can come off. and We'll see if this works out. On the inside we will have the exciter portion of the PDM with both the audio PWM and the RF driver mounted inside. And then we will have the two MOSFETs. MOSFET 1, of course, is the RF up top, and then MOSFET 2 will be the modulator down below. So again, we're keeping with the junk box style of construction for the transmitter, but it will be self-contained with onboard power supply, a complete transmitter. I'm going to also have an onboard relay system for TR switching. Uh, try to make this thing as complete as possible. When you're putting a TO3 on a heat sink, especially when you're drilling your own heat sink, it's okay to oversize the holes and it's always easier to use a proper socket. As you can see, this socket has built-in relief and that will fit into the hole and it will keep the transistor from shorting to the to the uh, case. It's important to uh, to make sure that you don't have a, a short circuit to ground right off the bat. So put that on the, the plate and then you touch all of the terminals on the socket just to make sure it's open. Now you can mount it on the board and wire it up. And I've mounted an IEC inlet that's protected and uh, filtered. A fuse holder. This is going to be the, uh, the antenna connector. This is the connector for the receiver. There's a TR switch in here, a relay. Uh, on the front I have a microphone 
PTT connector and the on off switch and over here I've got uh, a terminal strip that can handle things like receiver muting and things I haven't thought of yet so inside we'll have plenty of room to put our little circuit boards and our MOSFETs. And One thing I wanted to add was an ammeter. I uh, took the front panel off and uh, removed the uh, voltmeter series resistor from the inside so it's just a raw ammeter about 50 microamps. Having an ammeter in series with the the modulator and the final, the RF final, uh, tells me if I'm in trouble or not. So I've got kind of a green zone here between 1 and 1.5 amps that I think is going to be the sweet spot. And then we get into the higher current, uh, there's a possibility something's running away or we're going to over dissipate something. So first I just scanned the original meter and uh, I don't know if you can see this meter or not but I took this off the face of the meter and then uh, roughly marked where my points were going to be and then I in Photoshop I made my own meter basically put the colors in myself did the whole thing and then printed it out on uh, some hard cardstock cut it out and double side taped it to the front of the meter but you can see this is reading a half an amp and on the meter roughly we we'll go up to an amp say it's reading an amp on the meter an amp on the digital voltmeter you get the idea uh, the shunt is just a, a couple pieces of number 28 wire made into a coil and I kept cutting that back until I got the scale I wanted. So I do want to see what the current limit is um, on the LM117. It's specified at 1.5 amps. Yeah. Let's see what it limits at. I've got a, a load set up here that should draw about 2 amps. Looks like it's not quite 2 amps, about 1.75 and you start to lose regulation. So as soon as we put the load on there, it just sags a little bit. So that's nice. So that tells me that the, the current limit is just under 2 amps. And that's a nice safety factor. A nice graceful uh, current limit. So the schematic does not really give away what's going on with the modulator with these two coils but we can uh, we can probably figure it out this looks like it's a uh, a low pass filter to integrate the pulses into you know something that's going to be able to modulate at the audio frequencies now one or two components is not enough to get rid of the 60 or 65 kilohertz that we're using for our switching frequency but it starts the process now you would normally follow this with two or three more sections just like this and by that time you would have you know got your audio which is up to six kilohertz separated from your 60 kilohertz of switching frequency however he does something clever here instead of doing that with kind of a Butterworth type low pass filter system he puts in a tuned circuit like a trap and he's trapping out his uh, his switching frequency so I'm going to follow what he's doing because we want to try to stay somewhat uh, with his schematic and see how it works. Remember, we're at low power, so we're not going to have a lot of power in the sidebands that are created from the switching frequency anyway. Maybe this simple filter will do the trick. So I've wound up a coil uh, with some Type 77 material, ferrite, and I've got a 0.02 capacitor. And it is indeed resonating you know, in the range that we're interested in you know, around 60 to 65 kilohertz. So that's going to work. So what about those horrible coils that you find on the uh, ATX power supplies, the yellow with the white bottom? So these yellow and white uh, powdered iron number 26 cores that are commonly found in ATX power supplies are certainly not to be confused with the number six material powdered iron which are used for high frequencies. These guys you don't want to use anywhere above one megahertz. They don't have a lot of permeability compared to ferrite. This is type 77 ferrite. These two are equivalent. So this large number 26 powdered iron 
had to have 60 turns of the same wire to be equivalent to the inductance of this type 77 with only about 15 turns on it or less. And I'm using that for this particular filter here with a 0.02 microfarad capacitor and it ends up filtering out like a 60 or 62 kilohertz clock frequency. So you can use them. They have good Q below 1 megahertz, but uh, they don't have a lot of permeability, so you have to put quite a few turns on them to equal um, type 43, type 75, type 77 ferrite. Uh, there is one benefit. They're more stable over temperature. This is more able to stand the heat in a PDM uh, situation, simply because it's larger, first of all, plus the, uh, the powdered iron is a little more stable than the ferrite over temperature. So there might be a benefit to using something like this. But don't think you can get enough inductance on a little tiny Type 26. So the next filter is uh, L3, which is the filter that is used to do the basic integration filtering right after the pulse width modulator. And uh, this coil has to be substantial. I had some Type 77 in a 50 core, and I will try it with, uh, you know, some fairly fine wire. But uh, when you're trying to make about 7 millihenries to work against the 0.1 capacitor, so we have a cutoff around 6 kilohertz, um, you, you really need a lot of inductance. So to make 7 millihenries, um, I happen to have a... Uh, Type 77 core, a good sized one, and I put about 55 turns on that, and that's giving me a nice cutoff around 6.5 kilohertz. Putting the two filters together, that is the, uh, the first coil against the point 0.1, and then the series trap against another point 0.1 up at the bottom of the RF section. I'm getting over 55 dB of rejection, haywired like this. Once this gets dressed down to the board properly with a ground plane, I think we'll be able to do very, very well with this filter. So back to our original schematic, you can see that uh, we have three major coils that we have to determine. The first one we've already determined, and that's the Class E L1 coil. And uh, I've mounted that guy right here. Uh, you're probably wondering how it's going to fit every, everything into the cigar box. Um, Here's kind of how I manage that. Um, I have the, uh, the output circuit over here for the Class E. I've got the exciter system in the middle. Power supply stuff all over to the right. And the digital filter for PDM is going to be stuffed under the TR relay. So everything will fit inside. Now that filter, let's talk about that filter for a minute. We look at the uh, the filter components. It's a little bit gross. I found an appropriate coil, actually, this size here, and this probably would work as is. You need uh, about 50 turns on this large core to resonate around 60 kilohertz with a 0.02 uh, microfarad capacitor as a trap. So I decided to use those because they're more common on those boards. But certainly this size makes a lot of sense. And it's about the right number of turns as well. Probably need about 100 or 120 turns on this to resonate at 60 kilohertz with a cap in this range. It's not critical. Uh, it needed about 50 turns on the larger core. As I go to resonance, you can see we get a pretty good dip. It's over 20 dB, there's no doubt about that. The trap is working. Now, the way I'm measuring this, I'm going in with a, uh, a 6 dB pad, so I'm establishing 50 ohms here, because this is really a low impedance circuit. Um, we're, we got 15 volts, and we're drawing, you know, three quarters of an amp. If you do Ohm's Law, you can see that's a pretty low impedance, 20, 30 ohms, that kind of thing. So I'm just using a 50 ohm load on the output. So I'm just putting 50 ohms in, 50 ohms out, and just measuring for the dip. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the low-pass filter. Uh, 
on this side. So we're going to have a low pass filter going this way with the point 0.1 to ground here. Then we'll go into the trap and we'll see what kind of uh, rejection we get. So we're at 1 kilohertz and I'm just adjusting that for zero. And as we go up in frequency there's 2 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz. Okay, we're down a couple dB at 4 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, we're beyond 3 dB down, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 kilohertz, we're down 9 dB. So that's the kind of roll off that I wanted in the audio spectrum. I don't want a really hi fi range, I want to be down 9 or 10 dB by the time we get to 10 kilohertz. Now let's look at the, uh, the rejection at the switching frequency. So we're going to go back down to 1 kilohertz, and then we'll go by the, the times 1,000. So there we are at 10 kilohertz again. 20, 30, 40 kilohertz. Keep going down. 50 kilohertz. Okay, we're continuing to go down, down, down. Now 60. I'm on the lowest scale now on the meter. Of course we also have that final pull. Um, remember we have that final 0.1 mic capacitor up here that bypasses the RF to ground. That's in the circuit. So we have to count that as well. I'm just going to stick it on the end here just to see what it does. Okay, yeah, so, so it, it brings it down even further. But we need to see how that's going to disturb the 1 kilohertz. So let's go back up. Let's go back down to 1 kilohertz. Uh, that looks right. Okay, yeah, we're, we're back up again. Let's see how that 1, that point 0.1 mic affects our, uh, our 1 kilohertz. Okay, no real effect. Okay, I know what you guys are going to say. I might have gone a little overboard with the microphone uh, for the transmitter. You know, on the surface it just looks like I'm, like I'm using a wall outlet box, you know, a, an AC switch, a pill bottle, and you know, a hose hanger, you know, for the microphone. But don't let this fool you. Um, I've actually had inquiries uh, from Mr. Carlson's lab uh, he's interested in this microphone. So I've got a uh, electret element that's been epoxied in to the front surface which is totally flat and uh, there's a, a ferrite bead inside for RFI protection. Very important. Um, I'm going to be putting some deadening material into the canister and uh, this microphone will be what we're using with the PDM rig. You have to have uh, high sibilance of course and uh, this will provide that. So the real fun was getting everything into the cigar box and uh, you know you just kind of cut things down and put standoffs in do the wiring, um, the exciter portions in the middle here, the RF output sections here in the corner. I put the filter underneath the uh, relay. It fits in there pretty nice. And the modulator itself, there's not much to it. It's just a, a MOSFET, a limiting resistor going to the gate. So you can imagine that uh, this large inductor working with a switching transistor, the MOSFET or a bipolar, it's a MOSFET in this case, could produce a tremendous flyback current that could come back and actually damage the MOSFET. So we had to install a damper diode. Now the damper diode I'm using is a UF2004 you might remember he was using a BY-299. These particular diodes are extremely fast. They have to be fast to be able to dissipate all of that energy on the kickback.
Now, when you bring something like this up, you want to go gentle. Since it is relay controlled, uh, you can close the relay by hand and bring it up at much lower voltages and watch, for instance, to see if you're getting your, your pulse width modulator running, if you're getting your RF drive running. And once you're happy, that's, that's good. Then you bring the voltage up a little bit more with the Variac. And uh, eventually you'll see if you're getting some RF out with some type of a watt meter. Put your scope on the output to look at the RF envelope. Um, connect the microphone. See if you're getting any modulation on the scope. And so on. Uh, also, uh, since I do have a voltage adjustment, I can uh, set the regulator at 20 volts instead of 30 volts. And that also uh, takes it easy on the components as you're bringing it up. Of course, I buzzed it out to make sure there's no obvious short circuits. You can use your meter and do that with power off. So, when I did bring it up, I was getting RF out, I was getting modulation. It surprisingly came up very, very easily. Uh, the modulator worked almost perfectly. But then there was this hissing noise. And the hissing noise means that we've got something that's breaking down. At the same time you hear the hissing noise, the RF goes down until it settles out around 1 or 2 watts out. So that tells me it's something here in the RF section probably breaking down. Probably one of these capacitors. But that will have to be troubleshot. So, you know, the moment of truth has come. The moment of truth, of course, is when you bring up everything gently with the Variac. And you look for smoke. I have the regulator set for the lowest voltage, which is 21 volts, uh, for safety. I brought it up in kind of stages and actuated the relay by hand to see that the various stages come up. Now, when I go into transmit, I'm getting an interesting effect. I'm seeing the full carrier, and then I hear this hissing noise, and the carrier goes down. Nothing's smoking, nothing seems to be damaged, but it makes this interesting sound, like something is arcing over, possibly a capacitor failing over, or some type of arc and spark. But I can tell you, those FETs are, are strong devices. It would take a lot to blow them up. So, no smoke so far, but some interesting noises. Let's hit the transmit switch. Big carrier. Oh, that's terrible. Hello, one, two, three, four, five. That does look like AM, doesn't it? Hello, one, two, three, four, five. Hello, test. Testing one, two. But we've got a problem. Something is arcing over, and we're going to need to find that. But, you know what? It's kind of working. Okay, so I've got the little microphone here. Let's try to bring this thing up at 20 volts. So this is reduced power. Let's see what happens when I hit the transmit switch. Oh, you lots of power. One, two, three, four, five. Hello, one, two, one, two. But the power goes right down to zero. So our symptom is we have plenty of drive, plenty of output power, but it suddenly fades about two or three seconds into the transmission. So let's, I've got it set for the 20 volts, so it'll be safe. Let's turn it on. Full output power, 25 watts even. And now it goes down to about a watt. That stays there. But we do have modulation, as you can see. A lot of upward modulation. So it turns out I had a pair of problems, maybe even three problems. Uh, first of all, um, I had a failure in the Class E section of the transmitter. Um, this capacitor right here, which is the main capacitor in the Class E, 
um, the, it's in series with the inductor to produce a series tune circuit. Um, that's where the uh, arc over was occurring. This little guy here, I had a pair of 470s, and the 470s are supposed to be 3 kilovolt capacitors. Well, these things could not handle it. Uh, they failed, possibly by heat, possibly by uh, arc through, but they certainly are not acting like 3 kilo, kilovolt capacitors. This 600 volt orange drop is handling the power beautifully. No problem at all. So it's the quality of the capacitor, the ability of the capacitor to have a low ESR and uh, be able to handle the, the high frequency current. The second issue I had was the pulse duration modulation itself. It turns out that the TL494 chip does not like to be powered up suddenly and it takes quite a while for the chip to establish its free running frequency stably. So that's a problem, so uh, I can't switch it. I basically have to have the PWM generator operating all the time. So that was the fix. Uh, fixing this capacitor and uh, keeping the voltage on the TL494 uh, constant. By doing those two things, I was able to get stability and I was able to uh, adjust the power. The uh, I was getting some noise as well and some of that noise has to do with the inductors. Uh, this large inductor here would certainly benefit from some RTV. Uh, anytime you've got loose wire around a core and you're putting significant digital uh, through them um, you will get some uh, some noise, much like a transducer or a speaker. So it, it's a good idea to stake them with some type of RTV. Okay, so we've equaled pretty much what the guy did with his much simpler schematic, by the way. You have to give them credit. Uh, this is a, an amazing feat to be able to get an AM rig out of uh, so few parts. I've uh, certainly com uh, caused complexity to come in using more uh, digital parts than uh, just simple transistors. Uh, but uh, I think I've got something that might be usable on the air. I don't think they've heard a microphone of this kind of quality on the air, but uh, in our next video, let's try to make a few contacts with the PDM rig.